Well, hello! Welcome back to my channel. Just Shauna here to talk about some friggin' books. I have four books to talk about today. The first one is a reread, and that is Peace and Turmoil by Elliot Brooks. Can I set it up here? Will it stay? So obviously, I, I'm a little biased. I'm slightly biased. I will admit that. <laughs> but yeah, this is adult high fantasy, and the first time I read it was, hmm, 2018 maybe? 2017? I'm not sure. And it's high fantasy, like I said, um, and it's the land of Ab Abram? Abram? There's been 30 years of peace in this world, but now there's trouble brewing in various kingdoms, and there are various kingdoms here. We have some allies who maybe aren't such great allies, and then some known enemies that are becoming bolder. There's multiple POVs here. I did remember this from the first time I read it, and it was kind of the same the second time too where I think I'm just kind of a dum-dum sometimes. Elliot loves, you know, political intrigue and whatnot. There is a lot of that in this book. And the various kingdoms and the people in the various kingdoms, there's a lot going on. It's all very interesting, but initially the first like maybe 20% of the book, I was struggling a little bit with like, okay, okay, Dietrich is from where again? And then there's another guy with a D name, but he's, from over there and I had to look at the glossary a fair amount in that first bit to try to like just get myself situated with like who is with which kingdom and how they're related to this person um, which is often the case for me when there is you know multiple points of view and this large expansive world with various kingdoms I'm just always a little like what is happening now <laughs> the writing style it's polished. I mean, I think the writing is polished in this book for sure. The book itself is very polished for being a self-pubbed book, uh, certainly. And Elle's writing style for me is more on the kind of concise, like if you're looking at like on the concise versus super flowery, hers is definitely more concise to the point, which I think works really well for a world like this. If it was like super flowery, purple prose, really in-depth descriptions and shit, I think it would be to the detriment of the book with a world that is this expansive and with this many characters. You know what I mean? For me personally, anyways, it would not have worked. <laughs> Next, I read Age of Death by Michael J. Sullivan. This is book five of the Legends of the First Empire series. This is adult, epic, high fantasy. In the last book, we had a group of characters who started out on this dangerous quest, and in this book, they are actively on said quest. Uh, it is multiple points of view, though, so we pop in with different characters, seeing what's going on in other places, but then every time we're with that group, they're on this quest. The stakes are very high in this book, very high. And we learn a lot more about the mythology of this world and the gods and some interesting things are revealed. There's still some questions, but yeah, there was a lot of stuff where I was like, oh shit, no fucking way. I made a little like family tree for the gods uh, to like sort everything out <laughs> in my head. <laughs> so we, we do meet a couple of new characters in this one and they are very interesting. And with the characters that we already know and are familiar with, we get some really great character development, which was nice. And so with the plot, like I've said before, I don't tend to love quest stories. Like, I can, but there's definitely quest stories that don't do it for me, right? Um, but same as with Age of Swords, which had a quest in it, um, I just, this one, I think Michael J. Sullivan just does it well. Having multiple points of view helps, obviously, because we get a break from the little quest that they're on. We get to go see some other characters and what they are doing. But the quest itself was also logical and concise. It wasn't this wandering, meandering, what are we fucking doing? That's the thing with quests sometimes where I'm like, oh my God, can we get on with it? Like Jesus Christ. And that's not the case with 
Michael J. Sullivan's writing. And oh my god, the ending of this? Holy shit. It was so good and such a cliffhanger. Like, I yelled at the book. I think I yelled, what the shit or what the fuck? What the fuck is this shit? Something. I screamed out loud. Like, upset. I was upset for quite a while after putting this book down. I was just like, what? I, what? what the fuck? <laughs> and I wanted to pick up Age of Empire immediately, but you know, I'm doing the read along. So I was like, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait. It's only like, it was like a week and a half, two weeks. I can wait however many days. But yeah, oh, so intense, so fucking intense. And I don't know what's happening. And uh, several times I got upset, emotional. Some of the themes here, similar to other, you know, themes in the other books. Um, the power of friendship, for sure, and love. And also a possibility of redemption. That was a major thing here. I read through this very quickly. I absolutely had a good time, 100%. There was uh, one quote to save from this book. Malcolm is talking and he says, this war won't be won or lost by birds or dragons, nor by greed or hate, but by the courage and virtue of an unlikely few who will forfeit everything to save the future. That's how it works, you know? The proud, the greedy, the vengeful are never the ones to change the world. Not for the better, at least. They can't. They don't have the tools. It's like asking a fish to fly. It's not in their nature to sacrifice for others. But those who went to the swamp understand the importance of doing what's needed when the time comes. And they're not the only ones. So great. Oh, God. Malcolm. Malcolm. Towards the end, there were several times where Michael J. Sullivan just drops a bomb very quickly. Like, with very little fanfare. And it's like one sentence where you're like, wait. What the fuck just happened? What the fuck? Like, ah! Just casually, just casually, oh, somebody, like, something terrible just happened to somebody. And you're just like, oh my god, no! And it happened within, like, a couple pages, twice, where I was just like, holy shit, what the fuck? And then, like, two pages later, I'm like, oh my god, again! <laughs> what the fuck? <sighs> so, yeah, uh, gave this one five Pushina Corns, for sure. Oh, so good. Next was a nonfiction buddy read. Uh, ended up buddy reading this with Elle and with Monet at Life as Monet and with Jess, uh, Jess Owens. And the book is The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, right? Yeah. A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, I tabbed it up quite a bit and then highlighted quite a bit of stuff. It like, I stopped tabbing after a little bit because I'm like, I'm gonna use all my fucking tabs. I was tabbing every like, oh my fucking God, this sucks and is shitty thing. As well as a couple of places that I tabbed with pink where it was like a person trying to do the right thing within this fucked up system or trying to change trying to make some progress within the system and like it not working out. But yeah, this is basically about, I mean, how America was segregated, right? I'll read the, the back to explain it a little fucking better. It's a groundbreaking investigation into how US governments in the 20th century deliberately imposed racial segregation on metropolitan areas nationwide. Richard Rothstein has painstakingly documented how our cities from San Francisco to Boston became so divided. Rothstein describes how federal, state, and local governments systematically imposed residential segregation with undisguised racial zoning, public housing that purposely severed previously mixed communities, subsidies for builders to create whites-only suburbs, tax exemptions for prejudiced institutions, and support for violent resistance to African Americans in white neighborhoods. 
Rothstein demonstrates how police and prosecutors brutally upheld these standards and how such policies still influence tragedies in places like Ferguson and Baltimore. With painstaking research, the color of law forces us to face the obligation to remedy our unconstitutional past. So yeah, it's a lot. And yeah, he's basically making the argument that all this shit was unconstitutional as fuck and that we need drastic measures to fix this. Uh, drastic measures were taken to get us here and drastic measures would be needed to to fix the problem. But he kind of ends with saying like, the nothing drastic will happen until more people admit that this shit did happen. That it wasn't just a couple of individuals here and there making segregation a thing, that it was federally supported and upheld and was unconstitutional. Uh, more people need to accept this and recognize this and discuss this and kind of come to terms with it. And then we can move forward with some drastic measures of reparations, basically. And yeah, it's a lot. It, this book is very to the point, direct. It's not super emotional as far as like uh, Jess and Elle both read Evicted, uh, which is a nonfiction about people being evicted and, and just that the whole housing crisis and homelessness and this and that. Um, so similar vein, but they said that one was heartbreaking because of the personal stories being shown. Uh, this one is not personal. It's infuriating. <laughs> it was definitely infuriating over and over again. But I wouldn't say that it was like heartbreaking on a personal level. Like you're not reading a lot of really intense personal stories. There's a couple times where like a family is used as an example. But again, it's the writing is very, um, what am I trying to say? Like dry, clinical, just here's the facts and whatever. So yeah, I would say the writing style was kind of dry and bland but the information was not. The information was infuriating and, and not necessarily anything groundbreaking. Like I knew vaguely that like redlining was a thing and I obviously know that segregation was a thing <laughs> um, and residential segregation being a thing. Um, but yeah, like the details of it and so many of these organizations that like just blatantly are like, nope, you can only get a bank loan if you're white and all this shit, which like, you know, it happened, but just seeing all these examples and of the government upholding this shit, it's, it's just, it's just another example of like fucking America, you know, it's just great. But it was very informative and I definitely think more people should read this. Absolutely. Uh, people who don't understand this should read this, but will they? I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, it's a lot. America sucks <laughs> in a lot of ways. It's great in a lot of ways. Uh, really enjoyed this though. Definitely recommend. I ended up giving this one 4.5. And next up, the final one for this wrap up, Son of the Storm by Suyu Davies Okungbawa. Uh, this was a pre-order that I had. It's like a nice floppy paperback. This is adult high fantasy. It is very much a made up world, but it is heavily inspired by African cultures, mythology, traditions, etc. We do have multiple points of view. There's four, four or five, I wanna say. Uh, Donzo is the main, main character for sure. He's this guy right here. Um, and yeah, he's a scholar uh, going to this prestigious school he is, so in this world, there's definitely colorism here. Um, and basically the darker you are, they call them high black, um, the, the higher up you are in society. You are of pure, uh, Bassa is where they live. You're pure Basai. Um, and if you get lighter complected, then it's clear that you are of mixed heritage with desert landers or some other place and you are not of the high caste. It's very much a caste system. 
in this society, um, and Danso is of mixed like blood, whatever he. I, I don't know. If, I would say if it's mixed race. I guess maybe, but yeah, mixed heritage at any rate. He's not pure Basai, but he has gotten into this school to be a scholar and um, he's doing his thing there and he is betrothed to Eshime, Eshime. And Eshime also isn't totally in the higher cast. She's more so than Danso is because of her mother, but her mother kind of pulled herself up by her bootstraps and wasn't born into this life, necessarily. Um, she just made herself very useful to these higher caste people, so they have accepted her and welcomed her into their world, so then Ashime is welcomed as well. And yeah, they're betrothed to each other, but he's always kind of fucking up, and Ashime is like at her wit's end with him, and some shit goes down. Uh, I don't know how much I would want to say what's spoilery, yeah, there's magic that shouldn't exist. So yeah, when Danso stumbles across a warrior wielding magic that shouldn't exist, he's put on a collision course with Bassa's darkest secrets. Drawn into the city's hidden history, he sets out on a journey beyond its borders, and the chaos left in the wake of his discovery threatens to destroy the Empire. So there you go. So I really enjoyed these characters a lot, Danso in particular, and then there's another character um, that comes about a little ways in that I really enjoyed. Even Ashime, who is a, a fucking trip. She is a trip. I won't say too much because I don't want to give any kind of spoilers, but yeah, she's complicated, I will say. <laughs> um, and her motivations are interesting and I felt like they were well thought out and made sense and everything. And there's some really interesting character development in this as well. Super cool world. The traditions and the culture all felt cohesive and well thought out to me and made sense. Um, and I, for me personally, the way things were revealed and explained felt natural and organic to the story. Cause you don't just get told everything right away. I didn't feel that there was like info dumpy stuff happening, nor did I feel like it was clunky world building. It all just felt smooth to me. And the magic is really cool that, that we learn about and some like mythological creatures that are really cool. So for the writing style slash the authorial voice, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, as I was expecting to because I had read a book from this author before and it didn't love that book book as a whole necessarily like I didn't get super connected super invested in it but I liked the writing style and I really enjoyed it here as well I had several quotes to save which is pretty rare for me I don't use those tabs a shit ton but I had a couple here let me see if I can if any of them are non-spoilery oh this one was great oh this is great and I won't say character names or tell you any kind of context but a character is saying why do you trust in the good of the world so much? Haven't you been told enough lies? And this is a character who's very suspicious of everyone and everything, right? And then this other character says, I have, but I still believe there is freedom to be found in truth, for myself at least, and I can't find it if I'm always searching for the lie. Ugh, he's like such a hopeful character. Also, I read through this uh, pretty quickly, so the pacing was really good for me. It kept my interest, like, I was just like, I want to know what's going to happen next. The themes touched on here, I mean, as you may be able to tell from the quotes that I read, um, definitely truth and freedom and, like, freedom coming from truth and learning the truth and exposing the truth and that being true freedom was absolutely a theme here. Definitely themes of imperialism. Like I said, colorism is absolutely present here. You know, prejudice, etc. Faith in humanity and just general hopefulness absolutely was a theme here as well. And I just felt like all of this was touched on really well and in a thoughtful way. And I just, I don't know, I really liked it. So was it a good time? Absolutely. Absolutely a good time. I am very excited to continue with this series. I hope it just gets better and better. Like, 
this is such a good adult high fantasy for me. I really, really enjoyed it. So I gave this one five Pushinicorns. Absolutely. 10 out of 10 would recommend. Go read this book. There we are. Those are the books for today. Hopefully I will finish a couple more soon. As always, thank you so much for your time. Hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.